What's Francisco and my Francos? Francisco uh, this is Robert Evans. Yeah. Fart yep. and fuzz. Yep, there we go. We introduced it. Oh, yeah. It's not as not as big a name as Hitler. Like I'm going to be no. honest with you, not not doesn't have the kind of star power. Like if Hitler, Hitler's like cut. like Ben Affleck, right? Yeah. Uh, and and we're doing like the Matt Damon of fascism today. Like I, it's, yeah, he's yeah. just I just not the that same. Is, level. That is not accurate. You are completely <laughs> wrong. You just like his tattoo. Come on. <laughs> I love I love his trashy gigantic his, fullback phoenix tattoo. That's pretty funny. It's rad. Uh, okay, we gotta think of somebody that's like a deep Matt cut. Matt Damon so like, is more famous than Ben Affleck. That's I was gonna say, nonsense. Like, it's more like a Scotty Pippen. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. Scotty Pippen to Hitler's the Michael Jordan of yeah, fascism. Yeah, it's like Scotty Pippen. Better. We're talking the Scotty Pippen and he's like an Scotty Pippen. Yeah, Francisco Franker. Yeah, he's a yeah yeah yeah. Francisco's underrated. You know, he's yeah, a good. He's like, like well, not he's good. A, he's a monster. He had a shoe. Quite Scottie a Pippen had a shoe. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Pippins. Like we're yes. talking about like like Franco's, which would be yeah. jack boots almost as tall as the Hitler jack boots and not quite as shiny. Yeah. Um, and cost but a still less. jack boots. Yeah, and they're a little but they're cheaper. Still jack boots. Yeah, for the fascist on a budget, you know? <laughs> um so I think you just we're t- wanted to talk about the tattoo again. <laughs> I did. I always want to talk. And how <laughs> the and how hilarious. <laughs> and how sad Ben Affleck looks every time he's captured in the wild. Just looks like he's been dying for the last twenty straight years, when and I'm ex-wife I'm here for it. Picks him up I from love the it. Jack in the box. Oh, uh, it's incredible. Oh, he's oh, just so, so miserable all the time. It just feels uh, like he spent so much time being attractive mm-hmm. that he just got tired of it and was just like, oh my you God. Know, speaking I- of fascism, <laughs> <laughs> you've heard of the Fuhrer principle, the idea that like a single man can embody the spirit of a people, which is, you know, what Hitler used to rise to power. I never believed in it until Ben Affleck, because Ben Affleck is the spiritual embodiment of Boston. He really like he's, is. He's, yeah, he's perfect. Yeah, he's really basic. Yeah, he really is. Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah. Like if if the Southeast weren't so damn racist, I would really like that area. You know what I'm saying? Well, uh, I hate you, the Celtics, you, but yeah. Oh yeah, all day. Yeah, I don't know anything about the Celtics, but I know a bit about fascism and yes. prop. Fascism's a little bit different in every country. It's kind of yeah. like um, kind of like Skittles. You know, yeah, different flavors. Chocolate um, chips. Yeah, know, yeah, ketchup yeah, all those, chips. Yeah, Strange. milk chocolate as opposed yeah. to the dark. You know, this is part of why scholars and theorists have such a damnable time defining what fascism is in the first place. Yeah. There's a dictionary definition, right? There's going to be a dictionary definition in any dictionary you open. But it's not really useful in part because a lot of dictionary definitions of fascism apply almost as well to like communist regimes, any yeah. any authoritarian regime. Yeah. Which is, you know, there's there's some points there, which is that whenever you have a totalitarian system, similar bad things often do happen. But fascism is is unique for a number of reasons, including its ability to subvert healthy democracies. Um, and so when you have historians of fascism, people whose whole life is studying this thing, this amorphous thing that we're still kind of getting grips on, yeah. all of them kind of tend to have their own definitions of it. Um, and often those definitions don't contrast they're just different ways of kind of wording the same things. I tend to be feel confident that Umberto Eco has done the best job of defining it in his, okay. his essay on Ur fascism. I'm a big fan of, of the way Echo talked about fascism. And I think that Echo would have named Trump as a fascist straight away, um, yeah. in part because in the mid-90s, when he wrote his essay on Ur fascism, he predicted that the internet and like the way that it allowed, would allow people to spread messages and crowdsource activism would lead to the rise of a, fa- of a unique kind of fascist. And I, yeah. I think that Trump embodied that in a lot of ways. And I think Echo yeah. would have seen it right away. Now, I on the other I'm, hand, I think I may know where you're, where Echo's going. I haven't read the thing, but like I have this theory about the type of fascist that Trump is, but I'd love to hear what this guy says. Yeah. I mean, Echo, Echo kind of outlined a number of different things that are like that are when you have a, a mix of these things and sort of a constellation, that is what fascism is. So there's a mix okay. of like, you know, popular uh, resentment against the left, a, 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 like a sense of machismo, of, of misogyny, mm-hmm. um, a cult of action for action's sake, uh, syncretism, the ability to like pull other things in and kind of attach them to itself, other yeah. like aspects of spirituality and whatnot. Um, there were a bunch of different things that that Echo okay. noted as kind of key aspects of fascism. Okay, um, now, uh, okay. Oh, sorry. No, no, what were you saying? No, because I was going to say what was so interesting about like what I feel like what we're going to hear as history nerds for the next, you know, 100 years about the unique, this, the, what Trump symbolizes. And it might just be a new type of fascism for the rest of our life, but just this fascism that doesn't have a foreseeable goal. 
like except for just being in power you know what i'm saying yeah like, that was so that's what was so interesting to me about the uniqueness about trump's fascism is like yeah but what's your end game here like what are you what are you doing you know what i'm saying whereas like we yeah. knew what mussolini was doing we know what you know hitler what, uh, definitely hitler, it, we knew yeah he did it like we knew what you were doing this was your goal you know what i'm saying and i'm just like what are you, you yeah like yeah what are you, his, what are you doing dude you know his, His lack of a plan, uh, right? Trumpsingles.com. Yeah, apparently <laughs> Trump. Yeah, the, that's it's selling one of the things that does, in schools and universities. That does I think th- that did I think threw some people off is that he clearly didn't have as much of like Mussolini. I do think is more similar to Trump than Hitler is in the kind yeah. of fascist that he was and in his goals. But Mussolini had a plan to yeah. like take and hold power. And I guess one of the things that's been revealed is that like Trump definitely wanted to take and hold power, but he did not have much of a plan. Not <laughs> a, a plan. Yeah, I was like, your, yeah. your goal is um, to reach a goal, which and is. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Maybe? Your goal was like, just almost like, yeah, it, he's, there's a just, lot to be said. I, I don't yeah, have, you just want to here. keep being but right. I, you know, I, I and think, I'm like about yeah. what? Yeah. Anyway, let's go on. It's interesting. And a number of yeah. like, there are other scholars of fascism who took a lot longer to kind of decide that, that Trump fit their definition of fascism. I'm thinking about Robert Paxton here and Paxton is a, a very well-respected co- scholar of fascism. He wrote a book called the anatomy yeah. of fascism. That's a very good book. Um, and he only felt comfortable declaring Trump a fascist after January 6th. And he was like, that was the line. Like I, he was, he, he, Paxton had been consistent. He's an authoritarian. There's fascist elements in what he does, but uh-huh. he didn't kind of name him a fascist until after the sixth. And I like, I'm not, slamming packs and i think there's okay. a, a room for intellectual debate yeah, on this totally. and i understand kind of why he like like you said trump's a different kind of one yeah. right and where if fascism changes based on the country and based on the totally. time period you know mm-hmm. um and i do think kind of one of the things that echo was was sort of peering around the edges of when he was talking about how he thought we were going to see an internet based fascism in the future was the idea that like another aspect of fascism and he didn't define this as a key aspect of fascism but i think that it is is the fashion is the ability to find a way to utilize new media technology in a way mm. that no one else understands yet, which Trump did, yeah. right? No yes. other politician understood how to use social media in the way that Trump did when yeah. Trump came onto the scene. Yeah. Um, and it's a big part of his success. Yeah. Anyway, so there's a lot of debate over what is a fascist. And as a result of this debate, there's actually quite a lot of argument on whether or not the regime of Francisco Franco in Spain was truly fascist. And you'll, huh. you'll find a lot of argument about this, about yeah. whether or not Franco was a fascist. There yeah. were fascists in Spain, absolutely. Whether or not Franco and his regime really counts. Um, And what's not up for debate is that many elements of the Spanish right leading up to and during the Spanish Civil War were fascists uh, and that fascist powers, Italy and uh, and Germany, intervened in that civil war because they saw what was happening there as a battle between fascism and socialism, largely. Um, And more to the point, whatever you can say about Franco himself, and we'll talk about him more in part two, the battle over Spain in the late 1930s absolutely ranks as the first open military conflict between fascism and democracy and fascism and socialism too right like all of that was kind of in the mix yeah. and on the spanish side the republican side you had like the spanish republic who were you know liberals more or less people who supported like a constitutional democracy and you had anarchists and communists and socialists of varying kind of lesser strains yeah. trotskyists too who were yeah. it's a very complicated civil war it's more like syria than than a lot of other conflicts because totally. there's so much going on, so many different different uh, uh, kind of corners to it. What's now, interesting, real quick oh yeah. before you get into this, is like you know, in a past life, I was like a history and social science like high school teacher, and I went through the entire credentialing process all the way up to masters, and at no point in any of our California standards was it ever required to talk about this, and which is so interesting to me to when, especially when I'm trying to set up, you know, because since I wasn't a direct history teacher, I was more like a a social science teacher Mm -hmm. trying to set up how cultures get where they get and like why it was so weird around World War II and why we got so like, we was already itchy, why a lot of of us was like, man, we really don't want to go over there. It's because we was, I was like, well, because of the Spanish Civil War, like we kind of, you know, we was kind of going back and forth about sending troops over there. Like it was, and the students were like, wait, what? And I'm like, 
yeah, the Spain, yeah, Spain had a civil war. Like, yeah, yeah this happened. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? This was like, it was right before World War II. Like, this happened. It was like, it was this whole big thing. <laughs> that was like, it's a big thing. And we were involved. Like, we almost, you know what I'm saying? But just like, that's like in no. Thousands of Americans volunteered. Yeah. Yes. And I'm like, it's not required to talk about. And I'm like, oh my God, this is, you're missing this you're missing a lot of the story if you don't understand why even world war ii was so touchy for us yeah and part of it was this anyway go on one of the reasons people don't like to talk about this is that it is it's very complicated and it is not as much of a cut and dried story as makes it easy to sort of summarize right once the fighting starts once the civil war starts it is a bit easier but even then it's a very fucking messy war yeah and there are really shitty people um Uh on on the good guys side too right like there's a lot of like very ugly stuff that happens because it's a war you know Uh the same is true of world war ii it's just been heavily whitewashed and the nazis were so fucking bad that it makes it a lot easier to yeah make your side seem like the good dudes Uh um now in some ways like because of how complicated it is and we're going this whole episode is about the birth of spanish fascism and we're going to do some pretty deep history here um And in in some ways, the story of how fascism evolves in Spain bears a lot less resemblance to what's happened in America than either of the two stories we've discussed so far. Mm -hmm. But while the similarities are a lot less direct, I actually think there's a lot here that's valuable because we're going to kind of lay out how this evolved over time and how the birth of fascism in Spain was woven into the birth of democracy itself. And I think that's a really important story. Um, But we're going to need a lot of context. So Spain is unique, fairly unique among European nations in that it has not had a sense of nationalism for most of modern history. Um, not in nearly the same way that you got mm. with England or with France or with mm-hmm. uh, Germany once, you know, 1870, whatever rolls around. Um, the Spanish state does go back very far to 1478 uh, when Ferdinand and Isabella, you know, the, the Columbus folks, right? Yeah, when they decided um, to yeah. <laughs> colonize they, all of South America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And before that, Almost they were that. the ones like Spain, they kick out the um, yeah. the, the, the the Moors, you know, the, uh-huh. the, the Muslims who had kind of taken yeah. over a chunk of Iberia uh, uh-huh. as a result of a counterattack. Anyway, yeah. uh, they take back Spain for Christendom. That would be the way they would have framed it. Yeah. Um, but they don't actually make a nation, not in any modern sense. Spain is a bunch of independent kingdoms. And those hmm. independent kingdoms, up until fairly recently, never really melded together. You've got the Aragonese, and you've got Catalans, and you've got the Basque, and they all of their, and there's there's more than that, right? I, yeah. I, I, this, don't pretend, I'm not going to pretend this is good. <laughs> Spanish no, history is incredibly complicated. It's crazy, I, yeah. I am very far from an expert yeah. um and there are still issues with like uh, a, a lot of catalans and a lot of basque still want like some at, at least some degree of independence from the spanish yeah. state yeah. yeah recognition from the nation yeah yeah and they all have their own languages and cultural traditions and one of the things that i learned that's interesting actually is that um the 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 like Spanish, what we know as Spanish comes from the chunk of uh, like the, the language group that was kind of most dominant in Iberia, but they actually stole the word for the country from, I think it was the Catalans. So like it, it's, mm-hmm. it's very, anyway, yeah. very complicated history. Um, and for most of Spanish history, the only unifying factors of all these very disparate groups of people were the crown, the king and the Catholic mm-hmm. church um, and mainly the Catholic church. Right. Now, in the 1800s, Spain was dominated uh, by a revolution, or Spain was kind of overtaken, Spanish thought was overtaken by a revolution in classical liberalism, right? That sort of mm-hmm. takes over a lot of parts of Europe at this point in time. Yeah. And Spain is, 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 is included in that. But in Spain, this kind of new liberal wave largely failed to push for any kind of mass Spanish identity. It didn't, like, and you, this is where you start to get, like, French identity, right? And like, But you, mm. you don't really get that... Um, and it, I mean, in France, it starts earlier than the 1800s, yeah. but like you don't really get that in a big way in Spain. And part of the reason is that kind of the cultural elites fail to institute any meaningful education reforms for the majority of the population. Um, like France in the same period establishes a functional education system. And by contrast, Spain's failure to do this means that education remained the purview of the Catholic Church. They do most of the educating and it's mm. only for the wealthy. Um, and the country would deal with widespread illiteracy well into the 1900s. And when you don't have mass public education, one of the things you don't have is a widespread idea of the history and like what your nation is. And like, right, that's part of why. Yeah. Anyway, there's not nationalism yeah. is not really much of a thing in Spain um, yeah. as a result it's, of this. They're too busy killing off 
Mesoamericans. Yes. And they're absolutely, <laughs> that's one of the things yeah. that's weird. They're a huge imperial power. In some ways, yeah. they're the first world power. Yeah. Um, like the first power that's like on, on a level of like what the U.S. was earlier in yeah. our lifetimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Knowing like be, being a Californian married mm-hmm. to a Mexican woman, like, you know, yeah. you, you have to somehow kind of know a little Spanish history as yeah. to why these why these Mayans are speaking Spanish. You know what I'm saying? And like, mm-hmm. and, yeah. and, uh, you know, cause the part of Mexico she's from, they're from Southern Mexican Mexico. So like they're, they're kind of Mayan, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, um, but yeah, this like weird, like how they imp- exported this, like colorism and just yeah, this weird elitism. And yeah. But at the same time, can't nobody in your country read, yeah. you know? So it was just this weird, like thing yeah. happening with Spain. Yeah. It's it's very weird. And like if we're going to be completely fair, like if you look at the system of sort of slavery that was instituted in what we now call Latin America, yeah. um, it's it's one of the few systems of slavery in history that's like on the same level as what we had in the American South. Yeah. Like absolutely yeah, totally. and and, and, yeah. and genocides. So I'm not trying to like yeah. whitewash Spanish history no, not by at saying all. they don't have nationalism. It's just not yeah. it's not the same as it is with a yeah, lot of Yeah, that's what I'm powers. saying. But that's I'm I'm, I'm yeah. adding to it like that it's peculiar. Yeah. That they had such an imperialistic power mm-hmm. without this like national identity. Yeah, it is. It's Peculiar. very odd. Like yeah. Spain is a, an interesting country to study. Yeah. Now, the Catholic Church was a major force in Spain for pushing against the development of a modern liberal state. Right in the 1800s, mm-hmm. you don't really have nations anywhere up until like it start like that concept kind of starts like in the 1700s. You, you like thing shits a lot less. The idea of like a nation, the way that we conceive of one is kind of born in this period, 17, 1800s. Okay. And the Catholic church in Spain really pushes against the modern liberal state. Mm-hmm. Um, this was largely due to the fact that liberalism had a, an anti-clerical bias, right? The Catholic church yeah. for the medieval period is like the most power, the big power in the world, right? They mm-hmm. have influence everywhere in Christendom and they start to lose it in this period because governments are like well where are we going to let a church in Italy tell our government like <laughs> we're England I don't yeah. like I don't give a shit what you say yeah. You yeah. yeah um and the you know catholic catholicism's huge in Spain and the church is like well, we don't want any of this shit going on so yeah. Spain uh the church pushes against kind of a lot of of modernizing ideas and one of those things is that Spain fails to develop a modern military system and while it was again a massive military power they never do like what France does where you you start this idea of a nation under arms and a, a modern professional style of the military that takes a lot longer to develop in Spain and okay. it's part of why they don't do so well when everyone else develops a modern military hmm. right and they start yeah. losing their empire both to a combination of european powers taking their shit from them and yeah. from a lot of revolutions in places yeah. they had controlled that overthrows them. Yeah. Um, and so the 1700s and 1800s see a rapid decline in Spanish power. And it had been declining before then, but yeah. yeah. Now, the ultimate collapse of Spanish imperialism um, really comes in 1898 when the United States goes to war with Spain for no reason really and takes over Cuba just, and the we Philippines. Just take Cuba. <laughs> yeah. Just because. Like say, it's a just because. Just randomly, thing. Yeah. just like, yeah. hey, <laughs> you want a new yeah. imperial power? We could be that. Yeah. yeah. And there, you know, Spain is a, an unbelievably brutal, particularly in the Philippines. And then we take over and we're unbelievably yeah. brutal in the Philippines. And the yes. people there are like, oh, you guys, so are we going to have a democracy now? And we're like, no, 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 <laughs> no, no. We want no. your shit. Like, we want your shit, you know? No, <laughs> we're we going to take your we're shit. We're setting you free so we can own you. That's, yeah. I mean, I don't it's understand. That kind of freedom. It's yeah. that kind of freedom. <laughs> it's that kind of freedom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like we don't even let women in our country vote. You think we're yeah. gonna let you vote? What are you what are you talking about? <laughs> it's yeah. 1898, motherfuckers. So interesting. Nothing changes. <laughs> yeah. No. It's just no. your leaders speak English now. Yeah. That's I mean, difference. our guns are better. Our guns are yeah, a lot better, better than Spanish yeah. guns. Oh, their guns <laughs> sucked. That's why we're in charge now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, colonialism. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so one of the things that's interesting about Spain is late late eighteen hundreds, you know, eighteen nineties, uh-huh. early nineteen hundreds. That's like the height of of colonialism, right before yeah. World War One starts. Like like murders a lot of the great powers that controlled the whole world. So uh-huh. like they are the they are riding high. Africa's just been like you know murdered like in a lot yeah. of ways. Like colonized the scramble for Africa is like at its height. You know, Belgium owns the Congo. It's that period. Yeah. And so everyone else who's doing imperialism is doing gangbusters Uh and spain's empire collapses so what happens to everyone else in like the 50s 60s 70s Mm -hmm. um 
really happens to Spain like 60, a couple of generations earlier. So they actually go through the, they're an empire who goes through the collapse of colonialism while everyone else is doing great at colonialism, which is one of the things that makes them very interesting. So some of the things that happen in colonial powers when their empires collapse, these things that we've seen in Germany and France and England and that we're seeing now in the United States happen in Spain in the late 1890s because it's just the stuff that happens when you're an empire that fails. I find that really interesting. Historian Stanley Payne uh, calls 1898 the first modern post-colonial trauma in Western Europe. Um, And I think you do have to view it as a trauma for the people in Spain. And probably Mm -hmm. the best equivalent to our own society would be the ongoing trauma that a lot of Americans have faced in Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm not trying to minimize the traumas faced in those countries as a result of U.S. action, which are commensurately greater. But we've seen in the MAGA movement, right, and all of these like that that have come home and stormed the capital and shit. Like, yeah. it, it is a trauma. It's a trauma when yeah. you're an empire that fails. It fucks people up who were used to being the empire. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that's, that's, that, I, 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 I find that part, like, you know, as, again, mm-hmm. being a black dude, being like, you know, we, the, the, the saying, you know, that like, equality is oppression if all you know is privilege. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So, like, when, if you just, you're so used to the system working for you, the second it doesn't, you're like, something must be broken you're like yeah. well, no it was broke that's why it only worked for you you know what i'm saying yeah yeah, yeah it was always broke you it was just always were broke. one of the people it worked for so yeah uh, spain deals with this post-colonial trauma very early right before the rest before the rest of the western world right really does because mm-hmm. it fails for them they were the first for it to work and they were the first that it failed for which i guess makes sense yeah now Like in the U.S., all those failing colonial ventures that we had flooded the United States with disaffected veterans, uh, debt, and it fueled the rise of a resentful right wing, as well as fueling the rise of a dissident left wing, right? Like both of all of that stuff was really um, incited in a lot of ways by, uh, and obviously I'm not calling the dissident left a bad thing, um, but like uh, those horrible uh, colonial wars we had really fueled a lot of that. And the situation in Spain after 1898 is not all that different. Mm -hmm. now. With her years as a great power seemingly behind her, Spanish intellectuals began to wonder if the sense of exceptionalism that they'd always taken for granted had been based on false premises. And I'm going to quote from historian Stanley Payne here. I know, right? Interesting. Yeah. (laughs) Symptomatic of the dismay of the nationalist military was an editorial in El Geraldo Militar on 23rd November 1908 entitled Worse Than Anywhere. It declared, wherever we look, we find greater virility than in our own people in Turkey, Persia, China, the Balkan states. Everywhere we find life and energy, even in Russia. In Spain, there is only apathy and submission. How sad it is to think about the situation in Spain. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of feels like uh, us in the coronavirus. Mm Mm-hmm. We're like, mm-hmm. yeah, I think Americans can identify with yeah, a lot of what, just like, wait, what they're hearing here. Even if you don't like feel it, because colonialism's yeah. bad, you you know the intellectuals in our own society who are saying the same shit, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now, the Spanish political system was not at all stable domestically during the period after, like, while her empire was in free fall. And that's part of why the empire didn't last. From 1803 to the early 1900s, there were more than a dozen military coups. Between 1833 and 1876, Spain was racked by three civil wars, the Carlist Wars, which were not battles against everybody's favorite tertiary Simpsons character, but were instead members of a conservative pro-church political movement. The Carlists were the violent armed wing of Catholics, right? They were the, they, the the embodiment of clerical resentment against liberal Spain. They were religious Ooh. extremists who didn't want the country to modernize. Um, and I found a very detailed write-up for students on uh, Lyman.uk that notes the Carlist Wars, quote, were fought with a fervor and brutality derived from deep divisions within Spain. They also lasted longer than national wars and were more difficult to resolve. They anticipated the Spanish Civil War in a number of respects. There was a strong element of different and conflicting beliefs within the country, profound traditional Catholicism against modern liberal thought, regional Mm. independence against traditional central control, political liberalism against deep conservative monarchism. So this is all the stuff that's been cooking up in the background yeah. of Spanish politics at the turn of the 20th century. Now, partly as a result of the Carlist Wars, Spain had a relatively underdeveloped right wing in this period because, you know, a lot of them had getting, gotten killed in wars. Um, yeah. And they'd been very tied to the church. So there wasn't as mm-hmm. much of like a nationalist right wing. It was a Catholic right wing. Now. 
Spanish nationalism, as I said, was kind of nascent and didn't really start to erupt into the street until after World War One. Spain was neutral in World War One, so you'd think they might be in a better position because they don't really get involved in this shit. Um, uh-huh. And it does delay a lot of political extremism in the country. It's why they don't yeah. have like you know a communist movement that's really a big deal yeah. until after the war. Yeah. The first big street fight in Spain between radical political groups actually happened between two opposed groups of nationalists in 1919. Radical Catalanists, which are like big like advocates of Catalan separatism, uh, had been holding peaceful nightly demonstrations in favor of independence throughout 1918. In January of 1919, a group of right-wing Espanolistas, who were like nationalists, violent okay. Spanish nationalists, assaulted okay. this ga- gathering of peaceful Catalanists. Both groups battled it out in the streets of Barcelona in what would soon become a familiar display. The Espanolistas were a mix of local army officers and men from a group calling itself the Liga Patriotica Española. This violence was soon superseded by a spree of organized political murders by anarcho-syndicalists from a labor federation called the CNT. And this is like unrelated to the, yeah. the national separatism. There's also, and we'll talk about anarchism in a second, but the, a bunch of anarchist extremists start murdering people based on like, polit- like based on class, really. Yeah. Um, and that brings us a temporary stop to all the street fighting because the murders mm-hmm. bring the cops out against all sorts of what are considered to be political extremists. And it briefly, cla- it's, yeah. it's what we're about to see in the United States. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it yeah. briefly <laughs> clamps down on all political organization in the uh-huh. streets. Yeah. Yeah, now, great. In most of Western Europe, anarchists tended to be smaller, like they weren't it was fairly rare for anarchists to make a large percentage of political radicals in a European country. Okay. Um, and it's much more common for like socialists and communists to be a significant mm. like uh, force, a significant like sized force. Ukraine yeah. would be an, ex- uh, an exception to that. We talked about Nestor Makhno on our, our Christmas episodes. Um, yeah. And part of why Ukraine had a large and organized anarchist movement is that Ukraine was largely agrarian. And one of the things we see in, in like Europe in this period of time is that nations that have a large industrial base and a lot of industrial workers have a huge communist movement. Nations that are primarily rural and agricultural have a large anarchist movement because anarchists are more common, come, kind of come out of agrarian rural communities more often wow. than communism. Because communism is a workers' movement. Marx yeah. early on in his career was very much like, you like kind of wrote off for a long time rural people. Was like, no, it's all about the workers. It's about yeah. industrial, like them you can organize and you can use them to take, uh-huh. you know, take over the system basically. And like rural people are kind of a lost cause. And he did change on that later in his life. and saw, But like, that's part of why you don't really see communism erupt out of rural areas in this period. You see huh. anarchism when you see left-wing extremism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so wow. I'm going to quote it. Yeah, it's it's interesting, right? I didn't yeah, actually know that until I never recently. thought of that, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's part of why when I think about ways in which to pull people in rural America away from right-wing extremism, I think of more systems like democratic uh, confederalism or libertarian municipalism like Bookchin um, Uh that are kind of more of an, out of a more anarchist view. Because like a lot of these libertarians, I do think you can pull into a more reasonable system that's not right-wing extremism because a lot of their basic ideology is I want to be left alone. And I think you could be like, well, we want to leave you alone. We just also would like to be left alone. Can we figure out a way to like, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, So I'm going to quote from Lehman.uk again on kind of politics in Spain in this period. Quote, capitalist industry had not developed in the same ways it had in Germany, Britain, and America, and Spain had little in the way of organized labor. After small-scale beginnings in 1868, anarchism came to be a major revolutionary influence of the 20th century and was more widely embraced in Spain than other left-wing ideas. The movement first gained notice in the 1870s. After a violent incident at the town of Alcoy in 1873, when anarchists took advantage of a strike to spread radical ideas, ideas, causing the police to fire on the gathered populace, a clampdown was enforced that sent the movement underground. Consequently, it became largely based in rural areas, which were more difficult to police. Anarchism Hmm. was reduced to individual acts of terrorism, which in turn were met by repression and torture by the state throughout the 1880s and 1890s. By the early 20th century, terrorism had given way to a belief in anarcho-syndicalism. This was the theory that the state could be challenged by cooperative action by the workers in strikes. The Federation of Workers' Societies of the Spanish region was formed in 1900. This movement organized strikes to exercise political power and was again suppressed. Wage cuts and closures of factories in Barcelona in 1909, together with the call-up of men for a colonial war in Morocco, led to a general strike in the city on 26th of July. This turned out to be a major event, with 1,700 arrests, attacks 
attacks on railway lines and anti-clericalism, hostility to the Jeez. church. Eighty churches and monasteries were attacked. The government Jeez. response was swift and merciless, and five leaders were executed. And this is a big thing with like a, particularly the anarchists in Spain. They burn yeah. a lot of churches down, and they kill a yeah. lot of Catholic priests. Um, and some of that, a lot of that is them murdering people who didn't deserve it. And a lot of them, is, that is them murdering people who did. Cause the Catholic church is also terrible. They're like kind of wild. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. pretty out of pocket. Let's not, let's not, like, yeah, let's not if you, coat this. If you're yeah. looking for like a pure good guy or a pure victim, you will rarely find it in this. Yeah. Like there are, right? Yeah. Like obviously I'm not saying like, like there's nuns and shit that get murdered. That's not yeah. chill. Yeah. The Catholic running. church is also responsible for horrible repression. It's very messy. You know? Yeah. 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 There, yeah they you know they have their own you know both versions of like bastard episode of like the like the good christmas one that's like oh we invented orphanages you know what i'm saying it's like oh that's actually great you know yeah Yeah. and then there's then there's this yeah and this the catholic church is so big because you can also you could obviously we could do multiple episodes and we probably will at some point about the massive and pervasive sexual abuse of children that was enabled by the catholic church we could could and should also do a christmas episode on the significant number of priests and nuns in latin america who were like dogged and constant enemies of u.s imperialism and right wing extremism during like the period when the U.S. was doing most of its fucking around yeah. in Latin America, all of that's part of the church's history. All of it's you know? true that like <laughs> yeah, half yeah. of our hospital beds yeah. are actually Catholic. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, it, you know, it, yeah. There's like weird mix. What do you, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not a person who wants to like simplify all this. It's very yeah, messy. Yeah, yeah. And th- this is a messy episode. Messy so, boy. By yeah. this point, when you've got these anarcho syndicalists organizing and like and and in some cases carrying out not all of them, but some of them carrying out terrorist attacks, and some uh-huh. of those attacks are on shitty people, and some of those attacks are on people who don't deserve it. Like it's very yeah. messy. And at the same period of time, you've got Gabriel Denunzio in Italy occupying, well, I guess in Yugoslavia, occupying yeah. the city of Fume, and you've got yeah. Mussolini in the early stages of forming his black shirts and sicking them on left wing newspapers. Ooh. This is happening contemporaneously Ooh. to that. You're gonna um, have to like you're gonna have to really least with this one a uh a vocabulary list this is, <laughs> you've introduced some new names some new words to well some we people. talked about denunzio and few no no i'm not talking yeah. about him i'm talking about the different factions in spain uh, yeah you said a you said a narco syndicalism yeah, yeah a narco so you know what i'm saying a sternocleto mastoid yeah. out this bug you know what I mean? <laughs> a, a narco syndicalist the basic idea is that workers need workers who work for in like different factories or whatever who work in and farms or need to, need to form syndicates together to organize kind of like unions to organize and have syndicates that work together against the state and against capital in order to in some cases just gain better wages for workers in some cases in order to revolt against the system but like it's this yeah, idea yeah. that different organi- to, groups of workers need to organize themselves and then work with other organizations of workers rather than to, having bosses yeah. in a strict hierarchy and they totally you know? need to sell drugs. That's why they call it narcos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. The good thing about this period is that drugs are all legal everywhere. Um, so by this point, like I said, Denunzio's occupying Fume and Mussolini's in the early stages of like forming the black shirts. Fascism's getting started in Italy. Um, and in Spain, though, anarchists are by far the largest and best organized group of political radicals in the country. The communists aren't really a big factor and the right wing isn't really a big factor. It's just kind of the anarchists fighting the government a lot of the time. And the Catholic Church, you know, is is kind mm-hmm. of a lot of their like supporters are kind of taking the part of right wing organizing. But the Carlist Wars kind of drain them. So it's not a big deal there. Um, And this is not really the case anywhere else that you could think of, and it's part of why I find Spain so interesting. Fascism, by contrast, had a much slower time starting off in Spain. Portugal actually beat Spain to the punch when it came to, like, having fascists. Yeah. Um, And it was because a proto-nationalist group called Nationalismo Lusitano was formed in Lisbon in 1923, and it was directly inspired by Mussolini's Italian fascism. Now, a number of other Mussolini wannabes sprang up in Europe during this period. Uh, You could even call Hitler at the time of the Beer Hall Putsch kind of like a Mussolini imitator. Yeah. Um, But the idea didn't really catch on in Spain, not yet. Uh, Spanish intellectuals were, however, watching events in Italy. And one of them, a guy named Foy, suggested that this new political system might just be the thing to help rebuild Spain's failing empire. He wrote of fascism as a social movement. It gave voice to a vein of mysticism and idealism that exalted the concept of the patria and its full realization, the concept mm. of the fatherland. Yeah, yeah, patria. There's and, a patria and, coffee shop in Compton. Yeah. Anyway, carry on. With some troubling. Yeah. 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 So. 
the mm-hmm. the name of the game for Foie was National Restoration. Uh, but Mussolini's fun idea was popular outside of right wing circles too. There was actually a left wing Catalan separatist movement that found themselves drawn to Italian fascism, particularly its emphasis on militia based direct action. Mm. And they weren't fascists. They didn't uh, embrace, for example, Mussolini's doctrine of therapeutic violence. You know, the cult of violence for violence's yeah. sake. Yeah. Um, they just liked number one the imagery of this non state group of armed people marching in order to take power for themselves and they wanted to do that so like the left is when we talked about this in our first episode a lot of folks who are just kind of hate the system play with both fascist and anarchist and left and right wing ideas throughout this period of time um also i like that you brought up portugal because i feel like they always fly under the radar they do it's just everybody just not noticing they could just exist in the shadows they was the first in africa you know what i'm saying yeah so yeah like like nobody like how come nobody ever talk about portugal and and they're also the case of a country that was incredibly powerful and colonized a fuckload of the world and then collapsed before the rest of colonialism did yeah and you see the same thing happen in portugal where all these authoritarians start coming into power because there's this sense of like we need a strong man and this is like intellectuals in spain will be like we have to or in portugal will be like we can't have a republic for a while we have to have basically a dictator come in because he needs to fix everything. Like, we have yeah. all these problems we can't argue. We just need one yeah. visionary to come yeah, in. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's not quite fascism, but it's it has a lot of elements of that, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, Robert, can you hit an ad break real quick? You know what else has elements of fascism, Sophie? Hmm. Capitalism. Uh, uh, no, mm, no. Mm, capitalism. Like transition for sponsors Aspects. and services. Yeah, here's... Uh... uh We're back. We're back if, from. Sorry. If, if by strong man you mean a strong Sophie that keeps us in, mm-hmm. in place, then yes, these ads have elements of fascism. But it's yes. a good fascism. It's a yeah. fas. It's a fascist. Fashion. 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 Forward. Which is fascism. fine. Yeah. Fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> and we. Because our glasses appreciate- are dope. Yeah, They're we appreciate away. our podcast dictator Sophie. Yes, our podcast dictator who rules with an iron fist uh, yes. and does operate a system of political re-education camps. But that is a story for another episode. Correct. So. In late 1923, Spain gained its first real fascist party, the Tracistas. Uh, They wore a blue uniform because blue is the color of the working class for the right wing. Red is the color (laughs) of the working class for the left wing, right? Like, I know, I know. It's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, And we got it backwards here, which is weird, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, they wore a blue uniform and they hoped to spread throughout the country, but the organization fizzled. There just wasn't any real interest in fascism in Spain in this period. Now, while political fascism failed to gain meaningful purchase in Spain during this time, fascist thought and inclinations were spreading among a lot of influential Spanish thought leaders, and particularly within the military and military officers. Much of this had to do with the rise of the revolutionary left in the 1890s, these anarchists Mm -hmm. that I was talking about. In his landmark book, Fascism in Spain, scholar Stanley Payne notes that the military resistance to the left had less to do with politics than you might expect. Officers largely accepted moderate left-wing social and economic aims, and there was even a strong strain of anti-capitalist thought among Spanish military leaders. Despite this, Payne writes, army officers demanded suppression of the left's disorder, violence, and subversion of national unity. So again, Mm. it's this, uh, uh, the military's big problem with the left is they're disordered, right? They're trying to tear down this system and we're we're doing pretty well in this system. I mean, it's a thing that is always the case, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, This is messy because... The military itself was also heavily divided in this time, not along Mm -hmm. political lines, but between bureaucratic officers on the peninsula itself and combat officers who'd spent time fighting in Spain's last colonial possession, northern Morocco. So Spain's most of its empires has collapsed right now, but they have northern Morocco. And Spain had gotten Morocco basically during the last stages of the scramble for Africa. And it was it was given to them by France and England, who you might notice don't yeah. have the right to give Morocco to yeah, anyone, like, but wait. they did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was due to like diplomatic support that Spain gave them. Like it was literally yeah. like it was them the way that like a normal person would be like, hey, man, I'll help you move if you help me set up my sound system this week. Yeah. Like that's how Spain got Morocco. It's very That's crazy. Yeah, it's you know, it's it's, it's also, some bullshit. It's also a beautiful country. <laughs> Gorgeous, yeah. Morocco's yeah. beautiful, anyway. Um 
Now, so they were given the right to occupy the land by France and England in 1906 in exchange for diplomatic support. And Spain's conquest of Morocco was kind of like the first one night stand you have after a breakup. They they just had <laughs> like a big, you know, they, yeah. they, they, they needed something to boost their confidence yeah. after losing <laughs> to the United States. Um, and Spain turned out to be pretty bad at conquering Morocco. Uh, their control never amounted to much more than a few towns, cities, and roads on the coast. Much of the territory and its people refused to yield. And in 1921, a charismatic Moroccan leader named Abdul Karim rose an army and launched what became known as the Rifi Insurrection. For a time, it was the strongest rebellion against colonialism in w- anywhere in the Afro-Asian world. Like, these guys wow. actually do great yeah. um, for a while, you know? Uh-huh. Uh, now, the war attracted ambitious young Spanish officers eager to make a name for themselves. One of these guys was a fellow named Francisco Franco, who rose to the rank of colonel fighting the hmm. insurgents. Now, Francisco and a lot of young officers were very frustrated by the corrupt and bureaucratic nature of the military, which had not seen a major reorganization or modernization in decades. It was a lot, in a lot of ways, like a Napoleonic army with, you know, somewhat better guns, which is part of why they're getting their asses kicked. Now, Franco and a number of other officers formed military councils of like-minded officers uh, and lobbied for reforms, and some of those reforms were successful. But nothing they did was enough to right the inertia. In early 1921, the Spanish army launched an offensive into North northern Morocco from the coastal territories they held. Now, because the people in charge were idiots, they didn't properly prepare lines of communication, and they almost immediately advanced beyond their supply lines. No defensible forts were left behind to secure supply routes or water. And on July 22nd, after five days of skirmishes, a force of 5,000 Spanish troops were attacked by 3,000 RIF fighters. This should have been an easy win for a European military, but the Spanish had poor organization and were basically out of ammo because they'd outrun Hmm. their supply lines. Mm -hmm. So the Riffs, the Riffy, like, overrun the Spanish army, and they advanced, like, several hundred miles, slaughtering Spanish soldiers, taking over supply depots and positions as they go. The Spanish army shatters entirely. They Mm -hmm. lose more than 13,000 men wounded in a matter of days, and the Riffs suffer around 800 casualties. This is, like, a, like, one of the worst defeats suffered by any colonial power in Africa. It is, they get their asses handed to them. Yeah, I was like, Mm Mm-hmm. The defeat was so extensive and so shameful that the Spanish general committed suicide in the field and his remains were never found. Um, like it is, they, it is out bad. Out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Ooh. the riff, this whole insurrection is fascinating to read about. Cause like yeah. these guys fucking have it on lockdown, you know? God damn, um, man. It is hard to imagine how shattering this was to the people of Spain and their image of themselves and how much it disrupted Spanish politics. The military was, of course, enraged. And even though the failures were entirely their own, yeah, they yeah. blame their failures on the support of the civilian government. It's y'all's fault. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 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 it's y'all's fault we're bad at war. <laughs> that's what's wrong with my cheese mode. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's like, well, well could I didn't lose us. this war. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you see it yeah. on the right here, where it's like it was the liberals and like the left that yeah. lost us the wars. And like, no, you we're we suck at this. We're you bad just, at it. You look, man, <laughs> right? take it on the chin, okay? We're bad at it, and it's bad. It was you shouldn't have been there in the first place. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. If we fucking stopped this shit in like I don't know 1945, we'd still be like, you know what we're good at is war. Don't have to do it often. But we're good at it. <laughs> but when we show up, it's when real. we show up, yeah. 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 Uh, now, again, yeah, it really fucks up a lot in Spain at this period yeah. of time. Um, and obviously, the liberal government is also enraged, largely at the cost in Spanish life and treasure in this colonial adventure. And in early September 1923, three liberal ministers resign in protest because the military draws up plans for a new offensive in Morocco. And they're like, come on, guys. Like, you just <laughs> got your asses kicked. This is a terrible idea. Fellas. Fellas. Yeah, fellas. <laughs> Can you not take the message? You know what I'm Okay. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's bad. Yeah. It's bad, dog. Uh, Catalanists yeah. who didn't even really want to be part of Spain, let alone send their sons to die in fucking Morocco for Spain, right? held a huge <laughs> rally in Barcelona where the Spanish flag was dragged through the ground. Sheesh. This really pisses off the military, and it yeah. pisses off a bunch of senior generals, most prominently a career military man from a career military family named Miguel Primo de Rivera. Now, as the mm. captain general of Barcelona, the guy in charge of the military in Barcelona, de Rivera was a desk officer, not an African veteran, and that's 
kind of like the t- the the break between the army. Yeah, but divas. he sides with the African veterans, and he sees this liberal government as having failed his illustrious Spanish army. He also had seen Mussolini's march on Rome in 1922, and while he is not a fascist, he really likes Mussolini. And the hmm. march on Rome convinces him that with the army behind him, he could force an end to the parliamentary politics that he th- felt were holding the military back. And I'm going to quote now from a book called Fascism in Spain about like this revolt that de Rivera yeah. leads. The revolt began in Barcelona as a classic pronunciamiento. I'm sorry, Spain. It's all good. Um, with a local takeover in the Catalan capital by its captain general, who called upon the rest of the army and other patriotic Spaniards to rally round. In fact, also in the traditional style, all but one of the other captains general at first sat on their fence. The pronunciamiento uh, bleh, succeeded above all because the liberal government did almost on. nothing to defend itself. The issue was finally decided two days later by the crown, as Alfonso the Eighth, without invoking constitutional limits or procedures, transferred power to what would become the first direct military dictatorship dictatorship in Spanish history. Primo de Rivera gave no evidence of any explicit theory or plan. His assumption of power was at first predicated on a 90-day emergency military directory to deal with such problems as attempted subversion, the stalemate in Morocco, administrative corruption, and political reform. In fact, his only professed ideology was constitutional liberalism. He insisted that the Constitution of 1876 remained the law of the land and initially denied that he was a dictator in any genuine sense, insisting in his first public statement, no one can, with justice, apply that term to me. Oh, of course, God. everyone since has called him a dictator. Yeah, he's a dictator. Um, yeah, the Dude, years of de- Yeah. <laughs> what is it about? Is I have two questions about this. Like, I, I forget what I forget what what historian I heard say it, but he's just talking about like just generals. Like they all kind of have this like diva gene. Like yeah. they just they're just kind of divas. You know what I'm saying? Like yes. it's kind of hard to like. What is that? So that's like it, my first thing. It, it's very deep in in Western civilization, particularly, right? Like you yeah. have to look back to Rome at this stuff. So the way generals in Rome were were treated. Number one, if you were a general in Rome and you had a major military victory, the Senate would vote for you to have what was called a triumph, which is where you were. All but in, in all but name, king for a day of Rome, and there was this, yes. this. The whole city had this huge party for you, and mm. all of your trophies of war were dragged through the streets. And like because you were so powerful and so like basically worshipped that day, yeah. it was a, a, one guy's whole job to stand next to you the whole time and throughout the day whisper to you, "You will die at one point. Like you're going to die someday." Yeah, like yeah, that was yeah, like yeah. yeah, like that that like to remember. So they, and Rome constantly had civil wars that were the the result of generals taking their armies and taking power. It happened all of the fucking time. Yeah. Um, it's why you got Caesar. It's why it stopped yeah. being a republic, you know? Yeah. Um, one of the reasons why the United States military is organized the way it is and why there's such, if you look at like some of the shit the, the military was saying at the end of Trump's time, like why they had so many statements about the military having no role in the elections yeah. is because from the beginning, the founders of this country were like, that's going to be a problem. It's like, gonna if we're going to have issue. a military, that's yes. going to be a, and at first a lot of them were like, we shouldn't have a military. Why would yeah, you yeah. like, it always yeah. is a problem. Let's just have a bunch of militias, Yeah, you know, which yeah. there's something to be said for that. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, but, but like, yeah, this, yeah, yeah, they are divas. Like if you're going to take the responsibility for the lives of tens of thousands, thousands of men into your own personal control, you got to be a little bit of a diva, right? Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It seemed like it. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So obviously everyone today calls Primo de Rivera a dictatorship. The mm-hmm. years of his leadership are generally known in Spanish history as la dictadura. Uh, and this was met like his, his, coming to power was met by a lot less resistance than you might guess. Spain Mm. was exhausted by years of political bickering, foreign policy setbacks, and economic frustration. Several years earlier, political theorists in Portugal had talked about the need to bring in a temporary dictator, what they called an iron surgeon, to solve intractable problems. And Primo de Rivera was one of a lot of strongmen who came to power throughout Europe in this period, who weren't fascists, although they often admired fascists and took some ideas from them. Um, But de Rivera doesn't really have an ideology. He's just wants to like fix things and figures is enough of a narcissist that he's like, I know how to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, And while de Rivera wasn't a fascist, his brief reign would help further lay the groundwork for fascism in Spain. Mm -hmm. And the war that he brought to Morocco was in many ways a prelude of fascist wars of extermination to come. Only it was waged with the help of his allies, the French. Uh Uh-oh. 
Yeah. Oh. See, after the Spanish army broke at Annual, which is that big battle where they lose like yeah. 13,000 dudes, uh-huh. uh, the Abdel Karim, who was the, the guy in charge of the reef, um, and his, his, his like, insur- I don't know what you want to call them. I'll call them revolutionaries. Yeah. Established a republic. Uh, now, France, who just fought a, a whole war, you know, World War One, over yeah, what they, they claimed finished. was, was yeah. the right of national self-determination and who were a republic themselves, did not like that Abdel Karim and his reef had established a republic in Morocco. Because they're afraid. They own a bunch of Africa. They own a bunch of Africa near Morocco. Very close, like, yeah. Uh, people are going to hear that there's a republic that isn't run by Europe and they're gonna they're they're not gonna want to have us in charge anymore. Yeah. Like, yeah. Wait, this is an option? <laughs> yeah. Oh shit. Not having y'all as an option? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We can have a democracy and not you. Yeah, yeah. kind of so. Like, yeah, I kind of like that. Yeah, yeah. France is like, no, that's not that's not going to no, no, happen. No, 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 not an option. Not an option. Not an option. Yeah. So they decide to enter the war against the Rif on Spain's side to crush the rebels. In 1925, France and de Rivera's reformed Spanish army begin a counteroffensive against the Rif. Now, leading things on the French side was a fellow named Marshal Pétain, hero of the Battle of Verdun during World War One. And the guy who would become the leader of Vichy France during World War II. He's the guy who collaborates with the Nazis. Mm, um, now, Patain at this point, yeah, I know, he's a real piece of shit. Yeah, how come the um, Moroccans didn't kill this guy? Eh? He's, a, he's a war hero at this point, too, yeah. though. Because he, he led France through, the Battle of Verdun is, if you're making a short list of the very worst battles in the entire history of human warfare, Verdun might be number one. You know, Stalingrad, oh, wow. there's a couple of yeah. other, like... But it's it is it's in Nasty. it's in the running, you know. It's yeah. horrible. Like a yeah. million people die. It's a terrible, terrible yeah, battle. It. So he's a big war hero. And when uh-huh. he decides he wants to go to Morocco, the French government is going to give him everything he asks for. So he puts mm. together a force of 150,000 men to face Abdel Karim's tribesmen, who were very well organized and good fighters, but they numbered just 20,000. Oh. The offensive started Uh-oh. with one of the first, yeah, <laughs> amphibious so, yeah. landings. Yeah. There's no like Gandalf showing up and helping. No, 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 no. We, do, we don't. We don't get a Gandalf in this story. I'm no, sorry. you are outgunned and outmanned. Yeah, you guys are just like yeah. you're fucked. It's it's a bummer. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this amphibious landing is started spearheaded by a young colonel named Francisco Franco, who led the soldiers mm. of the Spanish Foreign Legion into battle. Now. You have seen the Spanish Foreign Legion. Um, Everyone in America pretty much did, because at the start of the coronavirus lockdown, when Spain had a lockdown and brought in the military to help, there were pictures of a bunch of very jacked and very handsome Spanish soldiers in incredibly tight-fitting uniforms marching down the streets of Barcelona. And a bunch of U.S. liberals were like, oh my God, they're so hot. Why can't we have those soldiers here? I'm going to tell you the backstory of those soldiers, because those were the men of the Spanish Foreign Legion. And it's not a great backstory. Oh, no. (laughs) So what's crazy what's crazy is about like the the uh the the geography right now. Mm-hmm. Like I don't know this backstory that you're about to say, but I'm just picturing the geography because off of Costa del Sol at the edge of uh of the edge of Spain to the tip of Tangiers in Morocco, it's just the Mediterranean Sea. It's a 90 minute boat ride. Yeah, it's so not like, a far ride. It's not yeah. far. You it's almost like you could sit in Morocco and watch yeah. it. Like, yeah, hey, here come the Spanish. You can get like, to yo, Spain. Man, you can get from way, Spain y'all. to Africa in the time you would get a quarter of the way across Texas, right? Yeah. Like it's nothing. Yeah, it's you know, not it really far. is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do we know who designed the uniforms? Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about we'll why the uniforms okay. look the way they do. Yeah. Ah. So the Spanish Foreign Legion <laughs> wait, were founded. Wait, 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 Sophie. He's not a pointy motherfucker. <laughs> no, 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 they're no. hot. They're hot. They're, they're hot. hot. Like they're okay. they're hot. Have you seen these uniforms? They're like a nice. Like, they are. Like, they are fashy yeah, they look as good. hell. V-neck. But they are. They are hot. The Nobody's pants, arguing that good. they're not the hot. Pants like, are yeah. subjectively way too yeah. tight. Yeah, um, no one is arguing that they're not good-looking men. Yeah, we're, um, we're not going to disagree about this. But one. problematic. No, no. So yeah, yeah, yeah. They're fa- the Spanish Foreign Legion was founded in 1919 in mimicry of the French Foreign Legion, since Spain was also mimicking French ambitions in North Africa at this point. The founder of the Legion was a guy named Milan Estray, a veteran of Spain's brutal war in the Philippines and of the fighting in Morocco. And he wanted to create a colonial army for Spain that they could use to regain some of their lost glory. Hmm. He created an interlocking series as he founded, like when he founded the, the, the Foreign Legion, 
he wanted them to be brutal because if you're going to keep a colonial possession, you have to murder a lot of people, right? Sheesh. That's how colonialism, where you have to kill a lot of people. Good God. And so your soldiers have to be soulless, broken men in order to gun down the proper number of children to keep an empire. Um, yeah, and these, he, he wanted shock hell. troops. Yeah. And very, yeah, I mean, and fine as hell. He, um, I just said, yeah. prop the, I she just, just sent me the picture. That's why I was yeah. like, good God. God anyway. damn. I, I know, I know. God Nobody's damn, arguing. Like, yeah. I get heterosexual why the reaction here. was what it yes. is. Yes. Like they, very, the Spanish you know, Foreign Legion today look like characters in like they look like characters in a pornography. This like is, they don't yeah, look like, like real no, soldiers. These, they look like yeah. fake soldiers from a sleazy porn. Yes. Um, yes. Anyway. Yeah. And they kind of did then. So Milana Stray, in order to make sure these guys are as brutal as possible, creates for them an interlocking series of hazing rituals with the goal of like shattering these men's souls. And oh, he wants to he explicitly, he's like, I want to separate these men from their past lives and mm-hmm. unify them in, quote, brotherhood and death. Now, God dog. <laughs> Milan Stray was a dog. big fan of the Bushido code of the samurai. Oh, he here cribbed, we go. Yeah, I know. I know all of these fucking guys. And he cribs from Bushido um, to write his own legionary creed, which emphasized tireless duty, bodily hardness, which is why they're all jacked, mm-hmm. unconditional brotherhood and fighting to the death. And I'm going to quote from a write up in Prospect magazine on the Foreign Legion here. Many of these themes were common across fascist movements and the militaries they influenced, but others were distinct to the Legion. Legionaries swore to become bridegrooms of death from the title of a popular song about a legionnaire's sacrifice in the Riff, renouncing familial and romantic bonds and sublimating them into loyalty to each other and the Legion's flag. You are married to death. Death is your wife. Sheesh. (laughs) Not married to the streets. Mm -hmm. You're not married to the game. You married to death. So if you think these guys are hot, I have bad news for you. They're fucking the Grim Reaper. Um, Yeah. Yeah. They sorry. You don't you don't attract (laughs) them. Yeah. You are too alive for me. That's not my type. Yeah. Um, so Dang. these, these guys, the reason why they have these shirts with like really open, weird necklines, um, is that I'm they, sorry. I'm going to need you to rephrase that. <laughs> what? What's weird th- about that? Good I for just, them. It, it's, they it's, have it's, it's, I, They're showing it off. Why are they you They are jealous? showing it off. It's also meant to emphasize their willingness to fight in the hot desert air. Um, yeah, and the green are. is from like the color. It's <laughs> like early camouflage. Yeah. <laughs> Sophie need her a zaddy. This is what I wish was normal. (laughs) Sophie, they are married to the concept of murdering children. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm not here for that, but the (laughs) They even got bulges, dog. I know they they have bulges. I said the pants are subjectively too tight, but like, go ahead. This is not functional. It's like a nice (laughs) pastel mint color, you know? None of that. You this uniform is ain't functional. Y'all they're have, not. You have to be married to death because mm-hmm. nothing about this says you ready to yeah. survive. It kind of looks like it kind of looks like if the Tin Man from the Wizard of Oz worked at Baskin Robbins and had to go do a porno shoot later. So Franco and his that foreign legion combo. men. Franco and his foreign legion men were the tip of the spear of the French and Spanish government's thrust into the heart of Morocco. Okay, the you know what you just did there. <laughs> nice. Are you joking? I know. Nice. Are yeah, you I know. I, I, nice. I know, Sophie, but we're about to talk about genocide, okay? Okay, but you know what you just did there. You know what? We need to take a break. <laughs> I, I, for I, that tip joke. of the spear doesn't just mean a dick. We need to take a break, Robert. Thrusted. That's All right. We're going to go to ads. All we're right. going to go to ads. And then we're going to talk about a colonial genocide. Fine. Yes. All right, all right, we're back, and we are no longer talking about hot guys. We're talking about the genocide those hot guys helped commit. Well, right. kind of genocide. You we'll brought talk. it yeah. up like that? Anyway. You know what you're doing, bro. I don't, I, I'm trying to emphasize that sometimes things that look nice are also fashy as hell, and it people might, are might enough, on guard. On sometimes, the sometimes the good looks will stick it to you. So the overwhelming you know what force. You just did there, too. <laughs> Uh, overwhelming force? No, that's <laughs> uh, anyway. Yeah, they just thrust their power the French all the, over. Okay, we, god damn it, yeah. <laughs> damn it. You okay, know what you're doing? Okay, I Sorry. know I'm trying to talk about the use of chemical war weapons upon civilians. All but, I'm okay. saying okay. is I've never wished Jamie Loftus was here more than right now. <laughs> I am very glad Dog, she's not. She we would, would, we would have murder us lost in the, the double entendres. <laughs> she's she's a professional at this. Jesus Christ! Yeah. I love you, so, Jamie. <laughs> 
the French and the Spanish have so many soldiers and so much high grade military hardware that there is no chance the Riff are going to actually win. Um, yeah. Victory was only a matter of time. But de Rivera and Marshal Patain were not willing to wait. And so they started using chemical weapons to slaughter tribes people in mass. And they're not using them on military forces. They first start bombarding the city of Tangier with uh, phosgene gas, which is mm. a deadly chemical weapon. It's mm. what they used in the trenches. It chokes people to death on their own rotting lungs. Yeah. Um, it's horrific stuff. Ugh. The Spanish army began pounding the outskirts of the town, uh, and as soon as Spanish forces started gassing tribespeople, other commanders in the country begged to be able to do the same. One Spanish general wrote of his desire to use them, them being chemical weapons, with delight. This was all mm. very good for France, who profited not just from stability in northern Africa, but because they were willing, they were selling Spain the gas, they also profited financially. I'm going to quote from an article on the website RS21 here. It was in fact a French business, Schneider, which in 1922 helped to open a plant for the production of toxic shells in Melilla. And indeed, uh, the French made an official request, one uh, French general, Liotli, made an official request to his supervisors for provisions of chemical weapons in June 1925, justifying that the use of these munitions with their toxic power allows us to spare human lives during our attacks. Wait. In face of these bombs dropped <laughs> at the most populated regions of the territories controlled by Abdel Krim, the Riffians tried to fight back with non-explosive projectiles, as well as making shells charged with pepper power, with little success. Right up to the end of the Rift War, the Spanish army would continue to use these lethal gases with the support of the French forces, with Marshal Patain at their head in Morocco. So, Damn. so to spare like, human but, life, they attack yeah. civilian targets with chemical weapons. They're like, so look, hear me out. I mm -hmm. didn't shoot him. Mm -hmm. I gassed him and his family. He just, he died from the air. Yeah, it's some real we had to destroy yeah. the village to save it vibes. Yeah, yeah. So victory in Morocco started the dictator's time and power off, we're talking about de Rivera here, with widespread popular support. He created a political party, the UP, the Patriotic Union, whose motto was monarchy, fatherland, and religion. His mouthpieces at the UP declared that the de Rivera dictatorship was only a transitional thing, and that the military dictatorship would eventually be replaced with a civil dictatorship. So hey, this what? military dictatorship, just temporary. We got a civil dictator. It's got to be fine. It's great. It's going to be a, a good, a totally reasonable kind of dictatorship. It's like you a dictator without it. the guns. Like, it's yeah. cool. It's cool. Yeah. 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 Uh, wow. Now, this would be difficult. Yeah. <laughs> so the the Patriotic Union, or the UP, was uh, mostly composed of middle-class conservative Catholic Spaniards. And s historian Stanley Payne notes that in some provinces, sectors of the old political elite did join and dominate, but the organization also incorporated ordinary middle-class people who had not previously been politically active. So in spite of the fact that electoral politics didn't exist during de Rivera's dictatorship, it served a purpose of rallying and in some ways activating the middle class as a political entity. The UP's goal was to ensure some form of right-wing dictatorship remained the permanent government of Spain. And much of their support came from their victory in Morocco and their success in, for the first time, igniting widespread nationalism among the Spanish population. The UP held the country's first mass rallies, and for a while, de Rivera and his party were popular. But by 1929, the worldwide economic crash had started to hit Spain as well. The wealthy financiers who'd backed his regime started to sour on him and some of his mm. interventionalist economic policies. At the same time, de Rivera faced growing resistance from students who were a political factor for the first time in Spain due to the fact that the dictatorship had reformed the education system. In his last years in power, Rivera sought to stay dictator by taking a leaf from the book of a man he idolized, Benito Mussolini. And this is the first time de Rivera actually kind of goes fascist okay. a little bit. I'm going to quote from the history of Spanish fascism here. Italian diplomatic correspondents from Madrid in the final days of 1929 reported that Primo de Rivera was indicating that he would soon begin a fundamental reorganization of the UP along the lines of the fascist party. This reorganization never got started. As Javier Tussel and Ismael Saz have written, what the Spanish dictator felt for Mussolini was considerably more than platonic admiration. He was pathetically incapable of transferring Italian institutions to Spain and was often infantile in his effusive expressions to Mussolini. So he wants to be a fascist mm. by this point. And he's like, he's kind of simping on, on, uh, uh, Mussolini on, here. On like just, Moo, yeah. Yeah. Just like, uh, you're so good. I just want to do what you do. Why can't I be as cool as you? <laughs> um, it's, it's kind of sad. My country um, he's an old man too, at this point. He's not doing great. Um, yeah. It is very weird. He's a Mussolini stand hardcore, but he just doesn't have what it takes to be a fascist dictator. He just, he's only a normal dictator, you know, yeah. you hate to see it. 
In January of 1930, <laughs> this dictator was shit canned by his king, who followed him out the door about a year or so later because popular support for the monarchy collapsed as a result of the dictatorship. Mm. For a brief, awkward period, Spain lacked any kind of legitimate government. Its king and parliament were gone. A short succession of strongmen held power as the national political elite struggled to cobble together some kind of functional government. The whole experience further radicalized the middle class, this time activating large numbers of Spanish liberals, who advocated in the streets for a Republican government. In 1931, the Spanish Republic was born. Okay. Now, this did not thrill a lot of people. Like, it thrilled people a lot of people, but it also yeah. kind of pissed off a lot of people, particularly young military officers who'd supported the dictatorship. Um, Francisco Freco was one of these frustrated men. He'd been a close student of Primo de Rivera and had liked his unofficial title of national boss. Uh, like Jefe Nacional Whoa, or something like El that. Jefe. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, yeah. Jefe Nacional is kind of what they yeah, called him. And he was Jefe. like, I like that idea. I like being everybody's boss. Dope. Yeah. Uh, hey. um, yeah I'm now, the years Jefe. of dictatorship proved to Franco that a strong man could unify Spain, bring law and order and military victory. The only error that de Rivera had made in Franco's mind was that he didn't have any kind of ideology. Franco didn't really believe in anything other than like, I'm the guy who can fix Spain. And when you don't have that that concerted kind of ideology, you can't hmm. hold together a dictatorship very long yeah. unless you're willing to be brutal. And Primo, you know, he was not a great guy, very brutal in Morocco, but was not willing to be brutal in Spain. Not really, and, not compared okay. to any other dictator, you know? And Franco, Franco was with him in Spain. I mean, was with him in Morocco, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Franco yeah. was like, he was a colonel in Morocco. Yeah, okay. Um, and so, and one of the, like, people will say that, like, de Rivera was a, a bloodless dictator, which, again, looking at what happened in Morocco, not true. I don't but know. if yeah. you're living in Spain, he's not mass executing people. He's not even mass imprisoning people. He's not he hosting huge executions of his political enemies. He's yeah. a pretty, if you're in Spain, a pretty mild dictator, about mm. as mild as they get this century, you know? Mm. Which is not to, like, whitewash him or anything. It's just, yeah. like, part of why he doesn't stay in power long, you know? You gotta yeah. be uh, more brutal than he is. If you're going to hold power as a dictator. Yeah. Now, Primo de Rivera's fall from power was also a lesson to Benito Mussolini. It convinced him that his regime could not afford to compromise its power at all with an elected parliament. This was, uh, and Mussolini saw basically like, ah, oh, the only option, I have to become so authoritarian that no one can push me out. And Damn. as a result, de Rivera's fall was a major, it pushes Mussolini to spring towards more radical authoritarian policy in 1932. <sighs> um, all of this stuff is interconnected, you know, just like everything, just like just like the Syrian civil war is directly connected to why President Donald Trump became the president, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Like, it's all, everything always is connected. That's the way the fucking world works. Yeah. The Spanish Republic would have just five years of pre-war existence. For its first two years, uh, the socialists dominated the government. So not like hardcore communists, but definitely like left wing. Yeah. Um, first two years, the left is dominating the Republic. For the next two, a center-right counter-reformation pushes back against the gains of the left. Uh, the tug of war was largely in politics between socialists, Republican centrists, and Catholic conservatives. And the Catholic conservatives, starting in 1933, were represented by Spain's first mass Catholic political party and first really powerful right-wing political party, the CEDA. And I'm not even going to try to tell you what it, it stands for. We'll call them CEDA, you know? Mm. That's the that's the, that's the the birth of, like, the organized political right in Spain in a way that actually is able to take some power. Dang. Now, the CEDA was the primary home for the conservative middle class who'd been radicalized first by Primo de Rivera's dictatorship and next by the early years of left-wing power in the Republic. And they're being radicalized both by the fact that the socialists are in power and they're doing the things socialists do, which is in part to say the church is not going to have power. Like, yeah. we're not going to, like, let the Catholic Church run things. But also by, the like, the anarchists who are still fucking up churches and stuff in this period yeah. of time. So it's, it's the same it is here. You've got kind of these more moderate people on the left and then you've got people on the left in the streets doing things that scare these religious conservatives and make yeah. them decide like we have to take back our country yeah. that happens in spain too it's a familiar story again to everyone listening yeah 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 um now, a number of socialist laws were passed that clamped down on the power and prestige of the church in this period. And obviously there were, again, widespread, like there were uh, anarchists attacked 50 convents in Madrid in 1931. And again, mm -hmm. this helps energize the right. It's also, if you're a Spanish anarchist who grew up living under a Catholic church that did all of the kind of fucked up shit we know the Catholic church to do, yeah. nobody's, again, 
Nobody, blameless nobody's here. shedding a tear. Yeah. Nobody is a monster here. Well, there are some uh-huh. monsters. We're about to talk yeah. about them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this enraged fundamentalists and the CEDA, like because of how angry they were at the left, the CEDA is never a party that accepts the necessity of democracy, right? Mm. They want to take power and institute a Catholic state. They don't believe the republic that they're participating in is legitimate, which also sounds familiar to a republic. Uh, and, the, the dominions. Yeah. The dominionists. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, again, while this is all going on, the radical left in Spain tried several times to carry out insurrections against the Republic. So the anarchists, because they're anarchists, do try to overthrow the Republic because they don't like the Republic either for different yeah. reasons than the CEDA. Yeah. Um, in some cases, they even fought alongside communists. Communists and anarchists are pretty good at working together in this period compared to how they'll be later. Yeah. Uh, they attack police stations. And in 1934, they succeed in taking over large chunks of the state of Asturias. This insurrection got far enough that the Republic called in their Imperial shock troops, the Foreign Legion, who brutally okay. suppressed their revolt by massacring basically everybody they could, um, just gunning Damn. people down in huge numbers. The thing, the only thing that they do, you yeah. know? That's why you have these guys, to murder everybody. To put everybody down. Everybody mm-hmm. shut up. When I get there, yeah. everybody shut yeah. up. Everybody sitting down. We do not my- have machine guns because we're good at being like at discriminating with our violence we have machine guns because it makes it faster you know sounds like (laughs) stephanie she just come in and (laughs) i'm not asking who did what or why Mm -hmm. this is broke everybody sit down yeah it's your aunt who comes in with the fucking sandal and just starts yeah she like just you all need to call you know what i'm saying because we in spain yeah, yeah, yeah. so she come in with the chocolate yeah. she just everybody, yeah. everybody getting it i don't got mm-hmm. no i don't want to hear nothing everybody getting it <laughs> yeah. you know what i'm saying that's uh, my aunt stephanie yeah what's so up on stephanie the- <laughs> the CNT, who's that anarcho-syndicalist party, launches constant strikes in this period, largely because they're angry that the Republic had failed to restid. So when the Republic comes to power, the far left is like, because the far left are anarchists and they're yeah. agricultural, right? They're primarily in rural areas. And most of Spain's agricultural land, like 70% or more, is owned by just like rich assholes who make mm-hmm. the people who are actually farming it pay them unreasonable rent and it like keeps them impoverished. And the radical left is like, we should, the land should belong to the people who farm it. Yeah. Maybe, why, why don't we do that? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I don't understand. We got a lot yeah. of radical thoughts. This don't feel radical though. Yeah. It doesn't, it's <laughs> not, it, like it is in the time. It shouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah. This really yeah. shouldn't be a radical thought. It shouldn't thought. be. They, they yeah. work the land so they should <laughs> yeah. own it. Let's see. Um, yeah. The Republic being a Republic gave them some of what they want, but not much. They redistribute about 10% of Spain's uncultivated land to the peasants. And that really pisses off the anarchists. Uh, so they launch a bunch of, in addition to these insurrections that other anarchists are doing, the CNT is doing like strikes and stuff in this period as protests. In 1933, a peasant protest was suppressed by Republican police who shot 19 of them dead. Um, so this government, which is broadly speaking, we'll call it a liberal government, is is a government. They still, you know, gun people down when you fuck up, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Now, the constant unrest damaged the left's middle class support, and the infighting between communists, anarchists, and republicans hurt the, broadly speaking, liberal and left ability to keep control of the government from the right. In 1934, the CEDA, led by José Marí Gil Robles, became the dominant power in government. Um, or at least gained a mm-hmm. lot of power in government. This provoked outrage from the Spanish. Like, they weren't in control or anything, but they had power for the first time. This really pissed off the Spanish left, because in the rest of Europe, at the same time, Hitler has just consolidated all of his power and destroyed Weimar democracy. Italy is completely fascist now. Um, and there's dictators all throughout Europe. So the left sees the CEDA gain some power and they're like, Damn. this is the start of what yeah. we're seeing happen. The fascists are going yeah. to take over. They're not wrong to be terrified that way because yeah, that is yeah, what yeah. happens, you know? <laughs> like, Yeah, I was like, um, it's happening. That's because yeah. it's going to happen. It's yes. happening here, they say. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, and wow. they're not wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, the left in Spain, and when I say the left in this sense, I mean both like the liberals, the anarchists, the communists, all the socialists, them. like all of them, uh, start to get really panicked. And this fear is reinforced by the fact that Gil Robles consistently gave speeches ranting against democracy and in favor of what he called a totalitarian concept of the state. Oh, uh, Stanley Payne writes, quote, it seems fairly clear that the CEDA's basic intentions were to win decisive political power through legal means, the exception being an ill-defined emergency situation, and then to enact fundamental revisions to the new Republican Constitution, which restricted Catholic rights, in order to protect religion and property and alter the basic political system. So again, they're not 
out of line to be afraid of what is going to happen no. by the CEDA gaining power. Left-wing fears that the CEDA would bring fascism to Spain were further stoked by the fact that CEDA magazines kept running huge, loving articles about how good fascism was. They would have, like, these huge spreads about fascist Italy and what a perfect state it was. There were articles about the Nazi regime in Germany. Now, broadly speaking, the Spanish far right is more Italian fascist than German. For one thing, they don't really get the anti-Semitism. Like like everyone in Europe, they're kind of anti-Semitic, but it's not an organizing principle for them. Yeah. the, and the, the Nazis they see is like kind of weird, but like still, you know, they're 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 better than the, yeah. the left. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like I, yeah. I, I get what y'all going for. I really don't understand this part. Yeah, but I don't. I don't know why you need you. this, but yeah, yeah, I'm vibing with you. We yeah. just we kicked out the Muslims. I mean, I yeah. guess it's the same, yeah. but I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. Robles even visited the guy in charge of the CEDA even visited Germany in 1933 to attend the annual Nazi Party rally in Nuremberg. So again. <laughs> <laughs> the CEDA is not entirely a fascist party, but the left in Spain in this time calls them objectively fascist, and you can yeah. see why. Now, yeah. for his part, Robles only really rejected fascism because he saw it as foreign. During a speech in 1933, he said, We want a totalitarian patria, but it is strange that we're invited to look for novelties abroad when we find a unitary and totalitarian policy in our own tradition. So he's like, fascism, like, I like it, but it's foreign, and we in Spain have our own totalitarian tradition that we should be embracing. And when he said this, he was actually referencing Ferdinand and Isabella, the first uh, Spanish monarchs, who were not totalitarian. It wasn't you, you couldn't be back then. You just no, like yeah, didn't exist. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah it, it was, it's very silly and very ahistorical. Yeah. Um, in the same speech, Robles continued: "For us, power must be integral. For the realization of our ideal, we shall not be held back by archaic forms. When the time comes, Parliament will either submit or disappear. Democracy must be a means, not an end." We we are going to liquidate the revolution. Liquidate. Liquidate. So damn. Yeah. That's In addition to the C D E D A, who, if you don't want to call them fascists, they're at least pretty close. They're fascists, low sodium fascists. Yeah, you yeah, know low saying? sodium fascists. They're yeah. like the they're like diet Mountain Dew. Yeah, fascists, like gluten free right? fascists. Like, fascists you know? like you don't want to go all the way, but yeah. you're on the on the spectrum. Yeah. Now Spain also had its own explicitly fascist political parties. And when I don't call the C E D A fascist, it's because I do want to differentiate between the people who are like, we're fascists, you know, yeah. like it, yeah. it is important to do that. Yeah. Um, that grew and evolved throughout the early 1930s. Now, the founding father of Spanish fascism was a guy named Ramiro Ledesma Ramos, or Ramos. And like most fascist intellectuals, he wanted to be a novelist before he got into politics. And he wrote a <laughs> fake memoir of it. Like, he's, it's very Ben Shapiro kind of Yes, dude. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he wrote a, a fiction novel, which was a fake m- memoir about a depressed intellectual who commits suicide suicide um which seems like it was very self-pitying and nobody is well he writes it when he's 18 nobody's willing to uh-huh. take it and his rich uncle pays to publish it which tells okay. you all you need to know about the desma the fascist you know, yeah, the father yeah, yeah, of yeah, spanish yeah. fascism so as the a pseudo intellectual Ledesma's greatest concern was that Spanish culture had not given the world a truly dominant political ideology. He complained, we are the only great people who have still not borne the philosophical scepter and who therefore have not projected an intellectual dictatorship over the world. Hmm. And so as a result of this, he decided to steal a political system from Italy and become a fascist. He eventually formed the uh, Juntas de Ofensiva Nacional Sindicalista, or Johns, and his followers are well called done. the Johnsistas, which is silly, but that's, that's, pretty that's silly, what they're called. But... Yeah, Ledesma and his fellow Johnsistas refused to call themselves fascists, but they were. They talked lovingly of Italian fascism, and they wanted the same things. One of Ledesma's first followers was the first Spanish translator for Hitler's Mein Kampf, but to his credit, Ledesma did try to find ways to make Spanish fascism unique. In part, he attempted to do this by marrying it to Spanish anarcho-syndicalism. Ledesma adopted mm. syndicalism, the idea of worker councils governing themselves and striking to make their demands met, or adopted aspects of that and he kind of awkwardly welded it to Spanish revolutionary nationalism and one of the things that is odd that characterizes Spanish fascists in this period is they really reach out to the anarchists they're trying to convert anarchists Uh. um, in part because the anarchists are like the most vital anti-government movement in this period. Yeah. Um, It is it's a weird yeah. Yeah they was reading the tea leaves of being like you know 
Mm-hmm. I think you don't like the same shit we don't like. Yeah. Maybe There's I can convince a way to you make to this be work. a fascist. Yeah. And it happens for some of them, right? Like that yeah. is a story that's very uncomfortable about anarchist history is that during the period of time when fascism rises, a, and a, a number of anarchists in different countries and an uncomfortable number of them decide, nah, you know what? I'm a fascist, which is yeah, not let's great. Just do that. Yeah. And it's it's important, you know, whatever whatever you believe to be honest about its history, and that includes the ugly parts. Um yeah. so Ledesma and his fellow John Cistas refused to call the and also we're going to talk in part two about the fact that a, a fuckload of anarchists died fighting fascism in Spain and were a lot of the very first people who were willing to put their lives on the line to fight global fascism yeah. um, before the United States was willing to fight the Nazis. A, a fuckload of anarchists yeah. died fighting fascism. And I, I like I'm yeah. not trying to to say that that like and that's much more dominant a part of anarchist history totally. than the one who went fashy, but a number of them do go fascist. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. something the fascists directly try to encourage. Yeah. It's, um, like, the, it's like the yeah. It's like the like the black Trump. Yeah. You're yeah. Like, exactly. Look, man, exactly. Look, man, <laughs> yeah. there's there's still us, dog. That's I yeah. can't lie. That's still yeah. that's, my, that's my uncle, man. Yeah. And it there. doesn't erase the fact that yeah. Biden only won the election it because of a fuckload of organized black voters, you know? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. So, like the left wing of the Nazi party had done, Ledesma sought to make fascism collectivist, stressing that the individual has died and that the collectivist state is all that matters. This hmm. was not an initially successful line of propaganda. And by the end of 1932, there were barely any John Cistas. Uh, Spanish fascism might not have taken off at all if it had not been for a fellow named Jose Antonio de Rivera, the d- son of the now dead dictator. Um, so de Rivera's kid becomes like really the, hmm. the first prominent Spanish. Spanish fascist. And one of the things, this guy is such a figure in Spanish history that he's one of the only people from this period of Spanish history who's known by his first names. He's Jose Antonio. They don't call, like they call his dad D. Rivera. He's Jose yeah. Antonio, which is like kind of a mark of how significant this guy was. Yeah. Now, Jose was a weird fascist, and we'll talk more about him in part two. He is <laughs> not like other, he's not nearly, for one thing, he doesn't really like violence in the same way that a lot of fascists do. Wow. And he's like, weirdly friendly with a lot of socialists like in government like like he's he's like like and not in a I don't know. He's a, he's a very weird fascist. Um, his background, though, makes complete sense. He's the rich son of a military family whose father yeah. took almost absolute power in order to murder foreigners and steal their shit. So it's yeah. not weird that he becomes a fascist. Yeah, um, he's like, yeah, yeah. He's just you know, it's like representation matters. Like, you have to see something to believe yeah. that it's possible. So he's yeah. like, my dad took over the country. I mean, I bet I can, too. Yeah, yeah, and you could see him as, like, kind of what I'm sure one of the Trump kids will try to do. Although, I would argue he's a better person than any of the Trump kids. Oh. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you did this. wow. Not a high bar. Yeah. Um, so he creates his own fascist party based on the idea of bringing in another dictator like his dad, but not sucking at it this time, right? Like, yeah. we need a dictator. My dad had the right idea, but he didn't have an ideology. I'm going to bring in an ideology. Yeah. And both Jose Antonio's party and the Joncistas receive a shot in the arm on January 30th, 1933, when Hitler takes power in Germany. A magazine, El Fascio, which is a very <laughs> subtle name. I'm sorry. <laughs> I peaked. My, vo- my uh, vocal peaked yeah. right there. I was like, oh, they turn to red. <laughs> El Fascio. Uh, yeah. God dog it. <laughs> so, so Hitler takes power in Germany and El Fascio gets launched in Spain and the government <laughs> shuts that shit down right away and bans publication <laughs> of future editions. Which is like, um, when in doubt, look, you want to, cl- you, need, you need your brand to be clear. Yeah. yeah. You need to be Trump clear. So there's. Dot com. Trump and we're, we're talking a lot in the United States now about the value of deplatforming fascists, about the and I, I'm an advocate for aspects of that, about the value of of taking away these people's ability to reach a mass audience. Mm-hmm. They do a harder, much harder core version of that in Spain. You get in one of the things that's unique about Spain is the police in this period crack down on the fascists more than they yeah. do on the left. Um, yeah. which is weird. Mm-hmm. Um it's it, unique historically. Everywhere else, it is the opposite. Yeah. Um and part of why is because the Republic is very scared of these fascists for good mm-hmm. reason. And if we're looking at like the effectiveness of deplatforming to what extent it works, Spain shows us that it doesn't necessarily stop them from gaining power because they deplatform yeah. the fascists. Oh, they try hard to deplatform the yeah. fascists in the Spanish Republic. It doesn't do the trick. Um, so again, useful historical context here, which yeah. is not to say there's no value in deplatforming, but we should be paying attention to what happened in Spain. Yeah. Um, and the deplatforming 
platforming in Spain is being done by the government, you know, um, uh-huh. by cops and shit. Now, the law for the defense of the Republic gave the Spanish Republic power to ban anything that threatened the Republic's existence. Banning fascist propaganda, though, was not enough to stop the contagious excitement over fascism and the broader right-wing reaction against the recent victories of the left. The Joncistas and Jose Antonio's movement grew. Jose Antonio was noted as not being particularly charismatic, but he was good with words, and he was a successful lawyer, so he had money. He entered into frequent public debates with left-wing intellectuals, where he would say stuff like this. So again, he's a big, like kind of like Richard Spencer, I will go down and sit down and talk with all of you. I'll be very nice, I'll be very polite, yeah. and I'll talk about fascism in that way. Mm-hmm. He's that kind of fascist. Okay. Um, Quote, this is uh, this is Jose Antonio from a debate he had with kind of a, a, a more liberal guy. The liberal state believes in nothing, not even in itself. It watches with folded arms as all sorts of experiments, even those aimed at the destruction of the state itself. Fascism was born to light a faith, neither of the right, which at the bottom aspires to preserve everything, even the unjust, nor of the left, which what? at the bottom does, aspires to destroy everything, even the just, but a collective, integral, national faith. And you can see why... People would be hmm. appealed to us. For things like, we're not right wing, we're not left wing, they're both bad, we're something different. And he also, uh-huh. the, the thing that all fascists have to do in order to succeed is point out things that are true and problems with the system. And he does. Yeah. The liberal state believes in nothing, not even in itself. You yeah. know? That's a good, that's it's a, a good, true statement. It's a good, yeah, that's a good, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, kind of got not, one there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's part of why, again, that's part of why he does succeed in bringing in some people from the left to the mm-hmm. fascists and converting people. Um, yeah. And at least in getting a lot of them to be like, well, he's not that, he's not as bad as the state. You know, a lot of people yeah. will say that. In July of 19, and a lot of people don't, by the way, anarchists murder a, we'll talk about this in part two, murder a fuckload of fascists in this period. Yeah. So when I say a number of people on the left are like, well, he's not as bad as the state, a lot of people on the left are like, no, they're bad and we have to start shooting them to death now. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So yeah. like, yeah, let's not, it's a lot, a lot's going on. <laughs> Um, you said in the beginning, this is messy. You know, yeah. It sure is. Yeah. In July of 1934, the Johncistas launched an attack on the Madrid offices of the Friends of the USSR, damaging the offices and threatening people with oh. pistols. Okay. This caused a government crackdown, both on the fascists and on the anarchists, arresting some 3,000 people nationwide. Again, like we're probably about to see, this is what the government does. Like, yeah, yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. I mean, in fairness, like right now, the anarchists are not doing much other than standing outside of buildings and breaking windows in this, they were gunning people down. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's different. Um, it's, di- it, yeah, I don't want to like try to make the case that Spanish history is exactly, but like you, I think there are useful parallels. Yeah. yeah so yeah. one of the things, again, Spanish police did arrest more fascists or, and more will, were more willing to, um, than other members of the left at the, or the members of the left at this point. Um, and in fact, the first two years of Jose Antonio's movement, anarchists assassinated and gunned down and stabbed a fuckload of fascists in brawls and outside of speeches. Um, now Jose Antonio was fairly unique among fascists, both in that he had genuinely warm and respectful relationships with a lot of left-wing politicians, and that he seemed to abhor violence. Uh, This was a problem for his young party, and we'll talk about that more in part two. Now, in October of 1934, Jose Antonio traveled to Spain for a brief meeting with Mussolini and to tour a fascist state. He found it inspiring, and he wrote, Fascism is not just an Italian movement. It is a total, universal sense of life. Italy was the first to apply it, but it is not the concept of the state as an instrument in the service of a permanent historical mission valid outside of Italy. Who can Mm. say that such goals are only valuable for Italians? He returned from Italy eager to make, and so again, the John Cistas, the other chunk of the fascist movement are like, we don't yeah. want to do a, a fascism, Italian fascism, because we, we're, we're Spanish. We're Spain, yeah. Jose Antonio's like, no, 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 fascism's a global thing, and it, it appeals to all of us. And he returns from Spain eager to make a deal with the John Cistas in order to merge both movements. He recognizes your propaganda's better, I have more people, I've got, I'm better at like organizing yeah. the street movement. If we work together, we can bring fascism to Spain. In early November, both groups of fascists came to an agreement. They initially wanted to use the name Fascismo Español, but decided to change this to Falange Española, which means Mm. Spanish phalanx. The Falanges Mm. would, in time, go on to earn a terrible and bloody reputation in Spanish history, but that is going to be in part two. (sighs) A lot of history in this. Oh, man, this is dope. One, it's like, for every, uh, I love the, like, for every kid that, you know, either sat next to or was the little stoner kid that was like drawing the anarchist A yeah. on their folder in high school that was just like, no rules. It's like, no, it's a 
It's a real thing. It, it's, it's not a, it's just an, you I, not, yeah. It's an ideology. <laughs> yeah. It's not just you not yeah. getting suspended for you know slapping yeah. a kid. Like it it's is a an real ID, thing. It's, yeah. it's a way to organize a, a, the world and society that the, and, and a bunch of different ideas. Right? The anarcho syndicalists have one. There's a lot of different. Yeah. Added in there are also anarchists like anarcho primitivists and stuff who don't want to org who who like yeah. want to go back to a more like it, it, there's a bunch of shit within anarchism. Yeah. 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 But it's yeah. not you with your little drawing, your little A on your skateboard, no. you know, your little shit. Like I mean, there's that, more that, that to it. That's how it starts. And I, I will say, I've seen a lot of people in Portland do very interesting things with skateboards. A lot of teenage anarchists this year. That's that's how it starts for some people. You okay, know? Okay, 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 okay. If, yeah. if that's if that's the entry level, but I'll give you it, that. It's deeper than that. There's a yeah. lot going on. You know, yeah. Anarchist I'm just like, hey, this doesn't complex. mean that you never have yeah. to read again. Chad, no. you have to In read. Fact, you have to read a lot. <laughs> okay, like there's a there's a thought. You know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know why I named him Chad. I'm sorry. Yeah, man. yeah. That's uh, yeah. Well, I I think I think we could stand to convert more of the Chads. Yeah. Um. Anyway, this has been part one: the birth of Spanish fascism. In part two, we're going to talk about the Spanish Civil War, which is yeah. one of the most fascinating and important pieces of history that almost no one knows a goddamn thing about. Um, and it's we're so talk frustrating. Little, it's very no frustrating. It's so frustrating people don't know like, about this. No, so many few people know that, like, the author of 1984, George Orwell, traveled to Spain on the premise that every single decent person should kill one fascist and yeah. then it killed a bunch of fascists with grenades. George yeah. Orwell was incredible with grenades. He yeah. knew all the different kinds of grenades. He killed a <laughs> lot of people with grenades. He got uh, shot in the throat. <laughs> like he's. Oh, my God. Uh, oh, yeah. man. I'm going to give it's, you this as another piece of trivia that has to do with the another hip hop trivia um, that you, this good Easter egg for your listener. Mm -hmm. And then for you, just, I think you might find this interesting and pull this out one day when you're drinking with friends. Mm -hmm. um, Ice T the, not the drink, but yeah, yeah, yeah. The rapper the, the that became yeah. the actor in law and order. Mm -hmm. The guy that made an album called cop killer. Yes. And became a cop <laughs> on TV. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, greatest hustle ever. Right. Yeah. Anyway, there's this story he tells that about when he was getting his record deal and he the the as as the legend goes he never played one song for the people he that signed him for his first record deal right and they were like how are you gonna do this how are we gonna why would you sign if we haven't heard any music he goes hey if you're selling a box of grenades mm -hmm. if i blow up a grenade I need to blow up a grenade for you to see, for you to know that they're good. Like I can't blow it up because then you won't buy them. They already done. Mm -hmm. And then the guy was like, the "Man, most that's a iced tea thing I've ever." Yeah, Jesus. so I see. And the guy was like, "Oh, it's actually a good point." And then he goes, "What made you think of that?" He goes, "Well, I used to sell grenades." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I see, and I totally believe that he was running yeah. around South Central selling mm -hmm. grenades. <laughs> I believe. Uh, I, 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 I would never call Ice T a liar for saying that he no, sold no. grenades. No, 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 absolutely <laughs> not. Yeah. He comes from a, you know, you've got your eras of gangster rap where they're just talking, and then you've got your era of gangster rap where it's like, no, you did all of the things you're no, talking no, no, about. No. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is why you're not in jail. Yeah. It's because you're rapping. There, like, there was a period of time yes. for you where you were like, it was a good day because I didn't have to use my yes. AK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These are true uh, stories, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. That's why most of them didn't make it very long. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, uh, all right. Well, yeah. uh, in preparation for the Spanish Civil War, which is pretty gangster. Yes. Listen, listen to some old school iced tea, you know, and there then watch is. some Law yeah. and Order, you know, really embrace the hypocrisy that we all embody at some point. You in don't our need some to point. You don't need to watch the iced tea and cocoa reality show, though. I Please am not re that. recommending that. No. I don't, Please don't recommend watch that. that. No, but a little bit of Law and Order, you know, it's whatever. It's on literally at all times. Yeah, it, it's a lot like it's a lot like heroin, you know? Um yeah. it's probably not going to kill you. No. Um but it's bad for you. I've seen but, every episode of Laundry to SVU. I'm not ashamed at all. Mm -hmm. Every episode. I believe it. Every episode. Every because episode. it's on at any given time of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. When my mom was yes. in the hospital, I, we watched every episode cuz it was always on. I've seen it's every on. episode. The there's a belief in some Aboriginal Australian cultures, and this is kind of where the um, 
um, what is the the, the long <laughs> tube that they <laughs> the they, they blow? Thing that's ever happened. No, no, no. The uh, the, the didgeridoo. The, thing that they, the didgeridoo. The, the, yeah. the didgeridoo ties into this. That like you always have to be someone always has to be playing music because you sing the world into being. And if the music stops, the world ends. And I have adopted as a religious belief that with Law and Order SVU. Yeah. I, where I, as I long really, as it's playing somewhere, the world can continue. I think you know? that's how we ended up with Trump, man. So everybody turned <laughs> off their TV one day and Law yeah. and Order stopped playing. We have one hour without Law and For Order and everything hour, went to shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, this, yes. this has been uh, part one of our <laughs> our two-parter of behind the insurrections on the Spanish fascism oh, and the Spanish Civil War. We're, we'll talk about Spanish Civil War in part two, and then next week we're going to talk about the fascists who failed, um, and we're going to talk about, we're going to give a little overview of some anti-fascist history you might not know. We're going to close out with Antifa um, and some fun stuff, like the, the Idlevis pirates, um, which were wow, little kids who yeah. murdered Nazis. It was great. Fucking yeah. rad. Um, all right. Rad. Here we go. Listen to some iced tea. <laughs> That's the episode.